So, good morning everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Chris Sanguin, I'm from the University of Edinburgh and uh, this morning we are going to run a practical stack workshop, getting started with writing your own stack questions. And I will just share my screen and show you what we're planning to do and just set some background. So, the information we need for today and for our uh, practical session is here. We've created this Moodle site, Getting Started with Stack. Um, there is some information here. Well, you've all read this because you've joined the Zoom session. We're going to have a short introduction by me. Um, then I'm going to hand over to a colleague from the University of Durham, Sam Fern, who is a relatively new Stack author, and he's going to give an honest account about uh, what it's like to write Stack questions as a new author. So I will be very interested to hear what he has to say on that. And then we will have a very practical session. And I hope within the next hour, so uh, within an hour of me starting, everyone will have been able to write a stack question for themselves. And then after that, we will reconvene for half an hour and we will have some questions and answers. Then uh, we'll, we'll have a proper break. People can go away and we will be back online um, from two till three for further questions and answers this afternoon. Okay, so you are all students on this site, um, so you can't edit anything here, but if you cross over to another Moodle site that we've set up, a question authoring site in due course, this is where you can author questions. So please read these instructions in due course because this is a shared area and everyone will be working in here. Um, some other announcements though, uh, if you are from if you are from the University of Durham then uh, please read your email uh, Sam will be offering special uh, a special area for you to work in which is on the Durham site you don't need to use the Edinburgh site so you will have a private area that won't get deleted um, and there will be breakout rooms for that as well you'll all be put into breakout rooms and we will uh, we will be online to help you with some of the practical things okay so we will also be online to have a question and answer session. We would ask that you put your questions and answers back in the original place where you came in this morning at the bottom of that web page is a question and answer session. So Zoom has all sorts of chat facilities and question and answer facilities and so on. But actually, if you put them in the workshop question and answers, they will persist after this workshop. They'll be available when we have a new Zoom chat later and myself and my colleagues will answer those questions and the answers will be visible to everyone. So I think it would be a better place to store those questions and answers than just using the Zoom chat. Okay, so if you've got questions about stack, please put them in that workshop. If you've got um, procedural questions about the, um, you know, you're not in the right Zoom room or something, then by all means use the Zoom chat for that. But please uh, put your questions about stack in the um, questions and answers and we'll monitor that. Okay, so I hope that's the plan for today. I've got a couple of minutes left. So what I would like to do is just explain what Stack is because there are now you know, 100 people online and unfortunately, unlike a face-to-face -face workshop, uh, I haven't had a cup of coffee with you all and I haven't had a wander around and chatted, engaged the room and found out who everyone is and where they're from and what they want to teach and all the rest of it. So I am flying a little bit blind here. I know there are some experienced people. I know there's some colleagues from Edinburgh, but uh, by and large, I don't know who you all are. So I'm very sorry about that. So I just want to just show you, show you what all the fuss is about, show you what this is. So I'm going to sh uh, share a few slides just to get started. Okay, so what is Stack? Well, Stack is a question type and it's embedded either in the Moodle quiz or in the Ilias learning environment. Okay, and Stack generates random questions. The answers, I don't think Zoom is doing the right thing with my screen here, so I'm going to go out of full screen. Sorry, folks. Uh, so Stack is a question type for maths. It, it generates random questions. The answers contain mathematical content. The whole point of this system is that we then establish the mathematical properties of those answers with a computer algebra system, in particular with Maxima. And on the basis of the mathematical properties that you as a teacher can choose to establish, we can produce some outcomes. So they will typically be uh, formative outcomes like feedback, a summative outcome, a numerical score, and then hidden in the background for you as a teacher are evaluative outcomes. So the system stores everything and you can then look at those and um, 
you can then use those statistics to improve the quality of your teaching, improve the feedback to students, you might choose to adjust the marks and so on. Um, we're going to talk more about that on Friday. Okay, so why, why did I build this? Stack is, Stack is software which I have written. Primarily I built Stack because assessment is the cornerstone of effective education. Um, it really drives student activity, it's the primary way we engage students in activities and so assessment has always been the heart of my thinking. And we need assessments worth teaching to. And also we need to take responsibility, we need to take responsibility for our core business. There are lots of major textbooks and um, the popular textbooks are increasingly coming with online assessments and resources. But I think as an academic community, we should be taking responsibility for those for ourselves and in our own teaching. And so having a tool, a platform where you can write your own questions as a teacher, I think is really important. We should have that. We need that. And my goal was always to collaborate on that infrastructure and then allow people to build their own questions and do what they want in their own teaching context. Now, it's kind of clear, and it has been clear for 50 years or so, actually, that maths assessment needs bespoke tools. We need to accept mathematical answers from students. Well, I've said I've got an open platform and that we should collaborate on the infrastructure. Um, but actually, um, Stack is widely used. It's, um, there are commercial textbook publishers using Stack to underpin their business. And it's widely used internationally. There are now about 900 registered sites using Stack and it's been translated into uh, all sorts of languages. Um, here's a large, there's a large group of people in Japan and they've translated the whole thing. So notice not only the questions translated, but all the feedback from Stack can be translated as well. The whole system is translated and individual questions can support multiple language versions. So for those of you who are not from the UK, um, I hope that Stack is already in your particular language. And if you need help translating Stack, then just let me know. Okay, so I'm now going to just switch and show you a demonstration quiz that we have set up here. So just to show you what it is that we are talking about, I will go to, let me just show you how to get here actually, it would be the sensible thing. So back to the home page of the site, into the demonstration site. I get asked a lot actually about this demonstration site. All the materials on this demonstration site are freely available. If you go to GitHub, I'll post this link, GitHub Maths, and you go into uh, Stack. This is where the source code for Stack is. You're all welcome to look at the source code. If you go into sample questions, uh, this demo, MBZ, is, um, is exactly this course, right? So you already have access to all the questions on this course. If you want sample materials or you want the question banks, there are tried and tested question banks here that we've used for example questions in a whole range of fields. So if you want that material, there's about 450 questions. It is already freely available. You don't need to ask me for it. Anyway, in here we have a demonstration quiz. I will continue the last attempt and jump back to question one. And um, here's question one. And this is, this is my contribution. So all of the quiz structure, the whole virtual learning environment, this is Moodle. This question here, this, this information is actually just an information item. It's not a stack question. And you can add information items into your questions along with all the other Moodle question types. But this is my contribution. It's a perfectly, perfectly dull uh, methods-based integration question. But it illustrates the points I made earlier. The student's answer has to be some mathematical content. We have separated out concepts of validity and correctness. So here is validity. You can't even think about that answer until it's got syntactic validity. And then you can choose to reject some things as invalid and not wrong, right? Uh, they might have meant 33 one hundredths, but I doubt it. They probably meant one third. So as a teacher in this situation, I'm not allowing floating point numbers. The separation of robustness, uh, sorry, the separation of validity and correctness massively increases the robustness of your marking algorithms. And when the student has decided that they're happy with their answer, we can decide whether it's correct or not. And here you can see the power of using a computer algebra system. We have really taken the student's answer and on the basis of that answer, we've tried to decide if it's correct. What does correct mean? Well, we might come back to that. 
It's not correct. So we have used the computer algebra system and we have built some feedback based on the student's answer. In fact, the derivative of your answer with respect to x is this, so you must have done something wrong. We've taken the student's answer, we've differentiated it, and we've included that calculation in the feedback. Okay, what's the correct answer here? Well, um, it's got to be a symbolic antiderivative, so let's see if I can get that right. Uh, live, I hope I can, good. There we go, that's valid. Now this is still incorrect. You need to add a constant to integration, otherwise this appears to be correct. And I have chosen to give that zero marks, and that's something we can certainly discuss. There are separate formative and separate summative outcomes, and you may not agree that that's worth no marks. Well, that's your business. Um, in this context, students can have another go, so I've decided that that's worth no marks. So let's add in a separate property that makes this answer correct. And now they've got it right. There we go. Okay. All right, so the rest is just features and I'd encourage you to come back and have a look at the stack demo course and um, have a look at the features that we've got. It's now just a features game. What can we do? What can't we do? There is a law of diminishing returns and the extent to which we can automatically mark free form proof is limited at this point and I think will be a very difficult problem. But uh, just because a tool doesn't do everything doesn't mean it doesn't do something useful. In fact, it does a lot useful. Okay, so that I hope it gives you a good idea. The goal of today is to make sure that by the end of this morning, um, all of you have had an opportunity to create a working version of a question similar to the one I've just shown you. And after that, you just have to go in your own directions and um, uh, we will try and help you uh, sort out those assessments for teaching. Well, how difficult is this? What have you let yourself in for? How much work is all of this? Does it work at all? Uh, or <laughs> what do you wish uh, you've known when you set out? Over to Sam, I think. Sam, you ready? Yeah, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Uh, that's the one I want. Okay, can you see that okay? Chris, just tell me you can see it. Yeah, that's Enjoy. great, Sam, thanks. Perfect. Okay, right, great. Um, yeah, so Chris just asked me, morning everyone, sorry, I should start with that. Um, Chris asked me to say a few words about what it's been like uh, working with Stack. So I, I first came across Stack sometime in the summer of 2018 when I met Chris at an e-assessment conference and was trying to learn about some of the different e-assessment tools uh, that were available. And we started using Stack in Durham sometime the following year. So everything that I'm saying is kind of um, been since sometime in 2019. Um, so I wanted to just kind of tell you what we've done so far, just so you know where, what my experience is with Stack. Um, so in Durham, um, our first year courses have uh, weekly problems that we ask students to turn in. Um, and traditionally, all of these were handed in as kind of paper assessments. You know, students would come in with their, their piece of work and it would get distributed to a bunch of markers and get marked and returned. Um, and our aim was to replace alternate homeworks with a formative online assessment uh, using one of the e assessment tools that are available. That's what we were hoping to achieve. Um, this was uh, made at a kind of at a department level. So, right from the start, I had departmental support. Uh, I was being asked by the department to investigate how this could be done. Um, which certainly made some things quite easy because I was working with the backing uh, of the head of department, uh, the director of education and so on. Um, but we spoke to the relevant staff members from the courses that we were implementing this in throughout. So it wasn't just kind of forced on people. We tried to, to take into account um, different people's opinions on how this tool could be used in their courses. Um, and our plan was to roll this out across all our first year modules over the course of two to three years. That was our uh, initial estimate. Um, obviously, uh, the COVID situation has potentially changed how, uh, how important that deadline was to make. And so we're now hoping to finish implementing across all our remaining first year courses for the coming academic year. So we've currently implemented this in about two roughly of our core modules and another one and a half of our auxiliary and service modules. Um, and just so you know how much kind of manpower this has taken, there have been roughly two teaching fellows who've been working on this since we started working with Stack. Um, so that kind of represents two people working on writing Stack questions. Okay, so 
why did we choose to use stack uh, over some of the other alternatives? Um, the firstly, it was open source. That meant that we didn't have to agree to paying some large licensing fee to start investigating this. And also we thought that we had confidence that any materials we developed in stack were going to remain accessible to us for a long period of time. Uh, whereas with some commercial product, we might find that suddenly we no longer wanted to pay the full license fee and we could no longer use anything we'd written, for instance. Um, the other more probably more important point is something Chris already mentioned in his talk, that it's built on the computer algebra system Maxima. So Maxima wasn't actually something I was familiar with when I started writing stack questions, um, but it was kind of immediately obvious that having the backing of a full tried and tested computer algebra system really meant that stack had a, a robust and rigorous system for doing for making tests about things like algebraic equivalency um, that potentially some of the alternatives to stack didn't have quite so much uh, rigor and i wasn't quite so confident that they were going to be able to do all of the things i wanted them to do um, and it also means you've got all the kind of tools at your disposal that you might expect um, with a system with a computer algebra system like Maxima. So that includes things like symbolic differentiation, symbolic integration. Those are tools that are built into Maxima and that you can immediately start using as a question author when you're writing stack questions. Um, it's also popular. What, why do I say that? Well, it meant two things. First, that it's well supported and is being continually developed. So um, Chris has, gone to many workshops and conferences that I've seen him at where he's been talking about the things that he's working on. Um, and so this isn't a tool that we feel is about to suddenly stop being developed. We've got confidence that uh, any uh, changes that might need to happen to the system are going to happen and that this is still being continually developed. And also that there's kind of a sense of community. There's a large group of people using Stack and that makes it much easier when, if, if, when I've needed to ask for help to find people that I can talk to. Um, and so, for instance, there's a, a project called Abacus, which is a, a, a resource bank of questions that you can look at joining on an institutional level. Um, and so that's what I mean by there being a, a kind of a community around Stack. So those are all the reasons that we thought uh, Stack was the tool that we wanted to start exploring. And um, there was one challenge, however, um, Chris, sorry, I should say, I always think of Stack as being a Moodle plugin. Uh, Chris introduced it as a Moodle and Ilias plugin. I know nothing about Ilias, so I'm just going to ignore Ilias for the rest of my talk. Um, but in particular, Durham uses Blackboard rather than Moodle. And so that gave us a little bit of a, a complication about how we were going to be able to use uh, Stack, given that it lives inside Moodle, when we as an institution use Blackboard. But luckily, the team at Edinburgh had already come across this problem themselves. And so Chris and George from Edinburgh were able to kind of help point me in the right direction and give me access to a tool that they developed. And so you certainly can uh, use Stack, even if you're a, a Blackboard institution. And I'll say something else about that slightly later. OK, so uh, what do students think about this? Is it worth your time? Because there certainly is some work here. Um, well, yes, it definitely is worth your time. Students seem to really appreciate the addition of e-assessment to these courses. So these are quotes that have been taken from some module evaluation questionnaires from our first year calculus module, which is where I first started uh, implementing Stack. Uh, overall, I love them. I appreciate the mixture between paper-based and e-assessment homeworks. And it works very well with half e-assessment, half marked work, as you can get feedback very quickly. So uh, this is something that you find in the literature if you start to look into e-assessment tools. You see people talking about the uh, importance of fast feedback as one of the reasons why you might want to use an e-assessment tool. And I thought it was really interesting that the students themselves picked up on that and with kind of no prompting identify that as one of the reasons why they really liked e-assessment. Um, and not they didn't just say they liked it. In fact, they then went out of their way to request that we added e-assessment into our remaining courses. Again, let me just note that that was done, uh, that was from a, a survey of the students taken before uh, the coronavirus hit. So they were already asking for e-assessment to be added to our remaining first year courses. Uh, and now with the coronavirus, that's certainly something that we would be doing uh, regardless. So 
the the first the, the main kind of uh, issue we had in our first year of using stack um, was with what's what gets called in Moodle uh, question behaviors. I don't know the term that Ilias uses for this, so this may be the wrong language to use if you're using stack through Ilias. Um, but in the demo that Chris just showed you a moment ago, uh, he, he wrote down his integral and he checked his answer and the, the system gave him some feedback. And then he changed his answer and he checked again and the system just immediately gave him some updated feedback. Um, so that's, that's one way of using stack where your student can input an answer, check that answer and then immediately modify that answer. That might be the most suitable thing to do for a formative assessment. But you can also choose to uh, let the student submit one answer and, and keep that fixed until you give them feedback on the whole assignment. Um, so these are what are called question behaviors. So you can have interactive with multiple tries and adaptive mode, no penalties. So adaptive mode, as long as I'm getting this the right way around, adaptive mode is the, the type that Chris showed you where a student can immediately modify their answer and immediately resubmit it. Uh, and in calculus, we decided that we wanted, um, if students were to have another go at the question, we wanted to re-randomize the question in the meantime. I didn't want any of the feedback that I showed them, if my feedback contained some, uh, some of the steps of the calculation, I didn't want them to be able to rely on that too heavily and just immediately type back in the correct answer. We used interactive with multiple tries, which meant the question was re-randomized uh, between the students' attempts. Uh, by using, in particular, I think, by using two different question behaviors across two different courses, we got plenty of uh, constructive feedback from our students telling us which of the two systems they preferred. Um, and it wasn't universal, right? We had some students that told us they much preferred it that the course in calculus used uh, the re-randomizing of the questions every time. And we had some students telling us that they really disliked the way that that happened in calculus and they much preferred the way it worked in linear algebra. So I think certainly this is something that you need to think about quite carefully when you start uh, using uh, any assessment tool like Stack is really think about the workflow that your students are going to go through and um, decide what's most appropriate. And maybe I think the thing that we got wrong was we didn't communicate clearly enough to our students why we'd made that decision um, and we weren't consistent across our courses. And so I think that's something that we need to uh, adapt for next year. Okay, so uh, here are five lessons that I learned. So I think this is the majority of the rest of my talk. So Stack and Moodle are robust. If you were concerned about using Stack and Moodle uh, for your course, our experience is that you don't need to be. We've had no problems with our Stack server that we're running in, du in Durham. Uh, our Moodle server, uh, we've not had the system go offline at any problem, at any point. Our calculus course was about 450 students and we were having uh, fortnightly assessments and we've never had a problem with the system going offline. So I've got no concerns about Stack and Moodle from that perspective. However, we did have some problems using uh, something called LTI, which is the way that you make uh, a Blackboard server to talk to a Moodle server so that for those institutions that are using Blackboard, you can use that same Blackboard login to get your users authenticated on your Moodle server and get any data that's coming, any grading data from the Moodle server to be passed back to the gradebook in Blackboard. It's certainly possible, it, it works. We had some problems with this in Durham. It was our own fault. We messed up our, our configurations, but it's certainly something that you need to just pay some attention to when you're setting that up initially. Of course, once it's set up, you should then have no problems going forwards. Uh, and I'm sure I'm going to put words in their mouth, but uh, I'm given that Chris and George helped me with this. I'm sure they'd be willing to provide some advice to anyone else that's going through this. And certainly uh, I'm willing to from Durham's point of view as well. If you want to send me an email, I can talk to you in more detail about that if that's a problem you have. OK, um, this is probably going to make more sense once you've actually started writing some questions. Um, but Stack has a feature for deploying some variants for its questions. So Chris said that stack questions are often going to be randomized. Um, and when I first started writing stack questions, I thought, well, as long as I'm careful, I write some good randomization and that's it, job done. I didn't understand this feature at all. But what this feature does is it lets you as the question author um, produce a set of random variants, say 50 or 100 random variants, and then fix that list 
so that when students get given a question, it's always from this pre-randomized list, if you like. Um, and that's a really helpful way to check that your randomization is really doing the thing you think it is, check that all the uh, questions are sensible, all the answers that your system is producing are sensible, and you don't have some fringe case uh, where suddenly everything looks really awful. So I strongly encourage you to use this question test and deployed versions feature. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, in my speaker notes, I was looking half a slide ahead. So uh, once you've written a question, you'll see this button for question tests and deployed variants. That's what I'm. That's what I was talking about. Um, I've had some problems with the Moodle, uh, the the text editor that's built into Moodle, with it adding its own HTML to the questions, and this then messing up my questions and causing some problems. I've been told this doesn't affect all Moodle text editors, but if you are having some problems, if suddenly a question that was working seems to have stopped working, uh, I suggest that you look at the HTML for the question and check that it hasn't had some gobbledygook added to it by the Moodle server. Uh, and that's a button uh, here in the Moodle text editor. So this is just a screenshot from my Moodle text editor. Uh, and there's a little button that looks like a slash in some squared brackets that lets you go and have a look at the HTML for the code. Uh, and if you've ever written some HTML before, that might be a useful way to diagnose uh, if you're having some problems. Um, you can control the output of the tech. So if you want something to appear in a very specific way, that is possible. It took me a little while to work this out. So um, in particular in Durham, when we taught differential equations, we tend to use uh, primes for differential as opposed to something like dy dx or dx dt or something. Um, so here's a little command that says, uh, when you try to print x1, instead print the latex x prime of t. So if you've got some very specific way you want your output to be uh, displayed, that can certainly be done. Uh, and my, my kind of final tip is it's not always easiest. The, the best thing isn't necessarily to cook up some really complicated randomization scheme that creates some super duper question. Uh, sometimes two questions are quite similar and you might feel that they should be random variants of the same question. But it can often be, it's sometimes easier, particularly when, you're, when you might want to give slightly different feedback, slightly different words to your feedback in particular, um, to just write them as two questions and use the Moodle quiz environment to randomize which question the student is given, as opposed to, try to, as opposed to constructing a very complicated question that's trying to do all of the randomization within the question. Okay. So that's my final tip. Uh, I think I'm at 15 minutes, so I think I will stop there. So, uh, thank Thanks, you. <laughs> okay, uh, there are a few questions in the chat. So uh, if there's anything urgent before we get started, um, so there's a question about the demonstration course. You can self-enroll on the demonstration course. Uh, it's just completely open access, but you'll need, um, you won't be a teacher on that because we want to keep that public. Um, okay, great. All right, let's move on. Um, thanks folks. Thank you, Sam, for that. Um, one thing I would like just to pick up on, you, you, you mentioned the question behaviors, right? <laughs> and, um, uh, one of the big lessons from all of this, when you try to automate a process, um, you really have to understand it. You have to understand what you're doing and you have to make conscious and explicit choices. And we've got choices at the question level. And today is all about building a question. Now those questions sit in a quiz and the question behaviors are a function of the quiz, right? Um, and then there's a whole other level, which is a course and program level. And, and so it is really very difficult to have consistency between your individual questions, between courses, between quizzes within a course, and between courses in a um, in a whole in a whole uh, program, right? And it's just it's just very difficult to build in that consistency. It requires a lot of discipline. You have to keep your electronic office tidy and all the rest of it. And there's just I just don't see any easy answers to that. One of my colleagues likened the um, liken the, the whole thing to being in a 747 cockpit. There are so many switches and buttons, there are hundreds and hundreds of options. 
And all I can say about that is that th these options all exist because people have needed to use them for good reasons. Um, there are com certainly co now combinations that are complete nonsense, but they've all been added because there are very good reasons for having them. And I make no apology for that. What we're trying to do is automate a very sophisticated business. Now, I'm, I'm not at this point trying to automate the tutoring process, right? That's a very different thing than just assessing the answer to a question. T tutoring is a much more complicated problem. But even just the assessment process has, has got some, um, has got some all sorts of options. I mean, Sam, another thing Sam highlight, highlighted there was notation. Ah, oh, notation, goodness me, the derivatives thing. Um, yeah, so one thing I would ask about that is, um, please ask whether the option you want already exists, because in many cases, and I'm pretty sure in the derivatives case that already exists and you don't, <laughs> Sam's now laughing because I don't think he asked me about that. Anyway, it's we'll follow that up later. Uh, but you know, it, it, there are now 900 users. So if there's something sensible like a prime for a derivative, um, it, the chances are somebody else has already asked for it. Okay. And in the long term, what I want to do is to collaborate on the infrastructure and build those into the core system. Because if you start uh, developing things off on your own branch, even if you're just writing lots of questions, you'll be repeating things within questions that you rely on uh, that could, could be a core feature. So please, please, please ask about stuff because um, we, together we can build a decent collaborative infrastructure that will um, support all those, those options. Right, okay, so how do we author questions? Let's move on to that. Um, and I will share my screen again. So what we need to do is we need to go to the um, workshop and from the workshop scroll down and we are going to move across into a separate Moodle course. So you are students on this site that we can see here so that you can't edit anything and you will need to register using this enrollment key stack 2020 without the closing parentheses so it's just stack 2020 if you click on here you'll move across to an authoring workshop site and by using that enrollment key you will now become a teacher on this site okay so you will oh, i just resize my screen you will become teachers on this site and this is moodle okay so if we scroll down here uh, with Moodle. So because you are teachers, you get the course administration tab and you can look at the enrolled users. And already I can see that loads of you are enrolled as teacher. That's great. So most of you are following along. Um, just some etiquette about this site. Um, multiple people are editing everything in this course. Okay. So if some of the sample questions that I've asked you not to edit break, that's probably because someone else has edited it. And also every so often, every few months, we just tidy this up and we delete everything, all right? So if you want to develop materials for your teaching in the coming session and you don't have institutional access, please ask us, um, we've done this before, ask us for a private separate section where uh, you won't get stuff deleted. Now the Durham folk don't need to do that because you've already, um, you've already got institutional access and Sam will help you with that. The Edinburgh folk don't need to do that because I, you know, we, we have access in Edinburgh, but if you're not from those two institutions, just ask us and we'll see what we can do to provide a, a, a private section. But for today, just to get started, you're all teachers on here and, um, and here we go. So there is full documentation for the system, but there are a lot of options and it's, uh, there's a site map all the, doc all the documentation is here, right? There's loads of documentation. But in particular, what we need for today is the authoring quick start guide. So here is the authoring quick start guide. And what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to walk you through the authoring quick start guide so that we can get to the point where there is a minimal working question, right? We're just going to go through this. All right. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen again and I'm going to resize uh, I'm going to resize that window so I've got more space to show you. You're welcome to try and follow this through, try and follow along with me. You're all teachers. Uh, we'll go through this slowly. 
Sam already mentioned the editor, which is the bane of my life. I, one thing Sam didn't mention that really is worth mentioning is that the database do, has no undo function, right folks? There is no way to undo anything. So if you delete a question, it has gone. And if you edit a question and save it, uh, it's, it's saved, that's it. So if you're doing something complicated on a question uh, or you've got something that's broken and you want to try out a fix, it's sometimes better to copy that question to a clean one, play about with the one till you're confident with what you're doing, uh, and then implement the fix on the live uh, on the question, especially especially if that question is live in a quiz, um, because you don't want to break it even more. You don't want to delete it. So just bear in mind with that. Again, the last thing I'm going to do before we um, before we get going on actually authoring a question is show you this business of the Moodle editor. Okay, so I'm now back in back in here and I'm going to go back to the authoring workshop course and I'm going to on the on the top right of the screen if you scroll up you will see your name I'm Chris Sanguin and just get rid of the I've got to move out I'm sorry I'm pausing so I'm moving the zoom control out of the way so if you go to this small triangle tab on the top right and click down you will get your user preferences which I will open in a new tab okay so these are my, uh, has that not worked? Okay, uh, preferences. Okay, so these are your user preferences. You can edit your profile. You can even change your own language. And there are a number of languages on this demo site if you want to try out stacking foreign languages. But I'm gonna to go to the editor preferences. And I strongly recommend that for editing stack questions, you don't use an editor at all. You will all have the default editor. And there are a number of Moodle editors. Moodle, the M in Moodle stands for modular. And so you can install all sorts of separate modules. You can install all sorts of different editors. Your institution may have chosen different editors, but I recommend the plain text area for the editor. So if when you're editing a question, it looks very different from me, that's probably because you're using a different editor and it does make a difference. So let's get going. I'm down on the scrolling down into the course administration and for you that may be closed so you may have to open the course administration by clicking on the small triangle and I'll go into the question bank and again I will open the question bank and I will click on the questions and here we have the question bank um, and the question bank is uh, is divided into categories you're welcome to create your own category so you can keep your questions out of the way by going into categories and exploring those options and I'm going to create a new question. So here are all the question types that you have available in Moodle. Most of the um, most of them are built into Moodle, right? So um, all these monochrome ones are the default Moodle questions, apart from Code Runner. Code Runner is useful for assessing fragments of code if you're teaching students how to program. Pattern Match was developed by the Open University. GeoGebra allows you to include a GeoGebra sheet as a question type. And this is my contribution, the stack question type. So we're gonna create a new stack question. And actually, I'll just say this once. You, of course, you can include all these question types in, in a quiz together. So you can mix, mix your question types to build the assessment that's appropriate for you. And stack is just one of those. And certainly what we're gonna explore over the next academic cycle is using the essay question type, which allows students to upload uh, photos of their text or a text file or to type their essay in to one of these editors and we'll be marking some of that by hand right let's not forget that we've got all these other facilities available as part of the educational mix okay on with stack I'm going to create a new stack question so now we're ready to look at the, the, the complicated form that we have to fill in so uh, let's get rid of that tab I'm really struggling with my tabs because the um, that's better. The zoom controls are in my way, which is a bit of a pain. Right. So author and quick start guide. This video has just gone through the steps I've shown you of navigating through the Moodle website to get to the point of editing a question. Right. So we're going to skip the video. But if you want to go back and watch that, we have a video tutorial. Um, so here we go. I'm assuming you've got stack and I'm assuming that you're minimally familiar with LaTeX and we're going to create a minimum stack question. So navigate to the question bank. Okay, so to create a minimum question, there are only four things you need. The first one is a question name. 
The second is called the question text. And that is the text which is actually shown to the student. It's the question. You as a teacher need to provide a model answer. Okay, you have to provide something which you claim is a correct answer. Whether it's correct or not, the system doesn't check. And whether it's unique is not important. But at the end of the process, one of the Moodle quiz options is to display the teacher's answer. So that's what gets shown to the student. And whether or not you choose to display that at the quiz level, when you write your questions, you are required to provide something there. Okay. And then you have to test whether the student's answer is correct. Fine. So you will notice that the instructions here ask you to give a question name, question one. So let's just copy from the documentation and let's go back to the editing tab and into the question name, I'm gonna paste question one. Now, if we all call the question, question one, it's going to be absolute chaos. So I'm gonna call it CJS question one, all right? We're gonna talk on Friday about question banks and authoring questions and quality control and larger scale things. My, my colleagues are gonna prepare to talk about that for Friday. It's so difficult to keep your electronic office tidy, honestly, folks. I mean, and we need to keep this shared area tidy. If everyone calls their question, question one, you won't be able to find your own question. You'll be looking down the list of who last authored it and all the rest of it. And if George or one of my other colleagues pops in and edits the question for you, you've got no chance of finding your own question. So please <laughs> find some system of naming your questions. And for the colleagues in Edinburgh who are collaborating over the summer, um, we have strict rules on how you must name your questions so that everyone else can find the questions which fit in a certain course in a certain way, right? We need, we need to have some discipline on that. So please, um, okay, I've said that. Right, but back to the, back to the editing. Um, most of these things are the things you wish you knew the next year when you can't find the questions because, you know. <laughs> so I hope, uh, I hope impressing you on that will shortcut some of that pain in a year's time. So there's my name, uh, CGS question one. This is where you put your random variables, but we don't need those for a minimum question. You can group questions. The question text is the next thing. So if we go back to the author quick start guide and we're gonna go through the question. So we're gonna, the problem that we're going to do for a minimum working question is differentiating X minus one cubed with respect to X. So I have put the question text. I'm just gonna copy that, go back to the editing form and I'm gonna paste it in here, right? I'm just gonna delete all that. Right. So this is a uh, question and then there are some tags inside the question and you'll notice that we're using LaTeX. Right. So I should probably um, put some LaTeX dollars around that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and then there are two tags in the question. There is a tag called input, ANS1, and there is a tag validation, ANS1. So ANS1, by default, is the name of the variable to which the student's answer will be assigned. So throughout the question, wherever you want to refer to the student's answer, it's just ANS1. That's the default. And you can have multiple answers, you can have multiple part questions, and you can call them any reasonable variable name, right? Um, I showed you the validation. So you can put validation anywhere in the question. And that will be replaced by your last answer was, and that will be if there are any syntax errors on the student's part, that's where the syntax errors will be displayed. And actually you can move these anywhere in the question you like. Sometimes it makes more sense to put them in front of the input box than after it, All right? So, but for now, that is just the, uh, the question text. So let's go back to the author quick start guide and let's just look at the notes that I've put in here for you. Right. Moodle has a wide choice of editors. I've already mentioned the editors. Uh, the text contains LaTeX, right? But only the maths environment. No, uh, no document structuring stuff like sections or any of that stuff. If you want to convert that to HTML, Pandoc is excellent. We can put some notes. Let me just make a note uh, to put that uh, in the comments later. Do not use the dollars, right? I've already used the dollars. Uh, you'll see I've put dollars in here, but you're not allowed to use those. So I'll come back to that. We have a bulk converter. 
The reason for this is that dollars conflict with currency and you, you, there will be business colleagues using um, there will be business colleagues using dollars in their learning materials and the filter that deals with maths is site wide. So if we allow dollars for us, it would break all their materials. So we don't use dollars. You have to use these maths environments. OK, I've said this internally. Answers will be assigned to the variable ants one. This tag. OK, so folks, I hope you can see as you're following me along that everything I'm saying is already in the author quick start guide. And if you've missed anything and you want to go back, I hope that everything that you need is in the author quick start guide. And um, I know from the many sites that are using stack, uh, many people have just worked through the author quick start guide without me and I've had no contact with them at all. They go off and do their uh, differentiating with primes without ever asking me if it already exists. Um, so, they, you know, if, uh, <laughs> If you, uh, if you want to follow this along or you've missed something, please go back to the author quick start guide and have a look because I hope, I hope everything you need is there. Right, answer one. Let's go to now to the input. We need to scroll down and there will be an input section of the form. So let's scroll down. Uh, specific feedback is the model answer, right? Um, oh, sorry, no, not specific feedback. We'll ignore that one. General feedback. If you click on this question mark, General feedback is cast text. We'll come on to that in a minute. General feedback, also known as a work solution, is shown to the student. So all these fields have help and documentation. OK, so let's scroll down. We're told to go to the input section. So this is the section which controls how the student types in their answer. And we want a simple algebraic input. There are uh, drop down lists. There are multiple choice questions here. You can have multiple choice questions if you insist. Sometimes they're useful. Randomly generated multiple choice questions have their place, but we want an algebraic input. And the model answer. So this is the other compulsory field. Okay, so for a minimum question, we must specify the model answer. And I am going to just copy and paste the model answer. Okay, so the model answer is stored in this variable. The model answer must be a maxima expression. There are two data types that we use. We use the maxima syntax for encoding mathematics and we use LaTeX for display. So whilst we use LaTeX in the question, in order to encode the answer, we have to use strict maxima syntax. So in particular, in this particular example, the multiplication must be a star sign, right? Okay. I've mentioned about different kinds. There we go. Right, now question have multiple parts and that's discussed later. Fine. So now the fourth thing we need to do for a minimum working question is to assess the correctness of a response. And this is the most complicated part of stack. So I think I'm just going to pause here for any urgent questions. There are a few things in the chat. Is there a link to the author quick start guide? Yeah, okay, thanks, good, good question. So let's just go back to that. If you come back to the, um, if we go back to the navigation bar at the top, we are in the uh, workshop auth. So if we open that in a new tab, we're back in the workshop. Welcome to authoring. The author quick start guide is linked to from the top of the authoring guide, right? So here is the link and that will take you to this author and quick start guide page. Right, so now we're going to assess the correctness of a response. So we scroll, I'll make this screen just a little bit smaller. We scroll down to the potential response tree. So a potential response tree allows you to establish expressions um, and establish the, establish the mathematical properties of the student's answer. That's the goal of the tree, okay? And basically what we do is that we will use an answer test. Sam mentioned those already. This is the answer test that will establish algebraic equivalence between two expressions. Right? So what do we want to do? To start with at least, we want to establish algebraic equivalence between the student's answer Now, to refer to the student's answer, we use the name of the input, which is ANS1. And we want to establish algebraic equivalence between the whatever the student has typed in and the thing that we said is the correct answer. Now, 
There are lots of answer tests because we will want to establish all sorts of properties. Okay. This test doesn't have any options. If we were dealing with numerical precision, we might have to type in an option to the test. The answer tests always return either true or false. They don't return any partial credit or anything like that because no one would agree on that. So the answer tests basically just return true or false. And if this is true, then we come down this branch, the true branch. And the true branch can modify any numerical mark. So if this test is true, we will make the mark equal to one, and then we will stop. And if this test is false, then we will make the mark equal to zero and we will stop. And it, we could add some uh, feedback here. Well done. And uh, oh dear. But that's not really needed for a minimum question. But there it is. You can add some feedback depending on this property. And that's it. That's a minimum question. So just to recap, what do we need for a minimum question? We need to give it a name, a unique, sensible name. We need to type in the question. We need to specify the teacher's correct answer. And we need to establish properties. And in this case, I'm testing one thing. And that is that the student's answer is algebraically equivalent to the correct answer. And that is my minimum question. So I've saved it. We've still got this LaTeX in here, which won't work. So if we scroll to the bottom, there is a fix dollars. So let's just fix the dollars. That will fix the dollars. So if you have a whole bunch of pre-existing LaTeX material with dollars in it, you don't need to tediously change that, folks. Uh, you can use this feature. Pandoc also does this. If, you're develop, if you are converting all your materials offline, uh, then you can, you can use Pandoc to fix that. So uh, I, I would say I have a very low pain threshold and I have a very low tolerance of tedious jobs. And my life is too short to switch dollars into uh, latex syntax, right? So if you find yourself repeatedly doing something which feels unnatural and repetitive, please ask because the chances are uh, someone else will have um, uh, be frustrated by that and there'll be a way to do it efficiently. Okay, so please, um, if you find yourself doing something unnatural, ask about it. All right, so let's try out our question. And I'm going to have to share my entire desktop now because I'm going to have to open a pop-up window. If we scroll to the bottom, we've now, because we've got a valid question, we can preview it and that will pop up a new window, right? Differentiate with that to respect to X. And I should still have that in my uh, cut and paste. There we are. So this is the validity feedback. If, I, uh, if I've made a syntax error, that's where the syntax errors will appear. That should be marked correctly because it's algebraically equivalent to the correct answer. That should be marked incorrectly because it's algebraically equivalent to, it's not algebraically equivalent and I've got my feedback, oh dear. There we go. Moodle stores everything. There is some cryptic way, answer one, has been given this expression. It was scored and the potential response tree returned a mark of one. In the second attempt, it was scored and the potential response tree returned a mark of zero. So this is very cryptic, but when you have multi-part questions with lots of properties, of course, uh, uh, you'll, get, you'll get used to reading that. Stat, uh, Sam mentioned the question behaviors. So you can change the behavior down here. So if we go to deferred feedback and start again with these options, you'll notice the check button now disappears because you don't get any feedback until you submit your whole answer and you get feedback at the end. You do get the validation feedback, but once you've submitted your answer, you can't change it. That's the whole point of the deferred feedback behavior. Now, I have to say, um, Separating out questions and quizzes turns out to be quite difficult, and particularly when it comes to multi-part questions, or if you wanted to do some kind of adaptive testing where the next question depends on your previous question responses and all this stuff. So separating out the, you know, what should be coded into the question and what should be coded into the quiz is, this is one of these bewildering range of options that you have. And this question behavior layer is a really elegant intermediary between the questions and the quizzes and it allows a, uh, a human to impose some uniform behavior over all the questions in a particular quiz in a very efficient way. Uh, it was de designed by Tim Hunt at the Open University. It's by no means an obvious abstraction layer and I think it's excellent. So please uh, 
spend a little bit of time to find out about the Moodle question behavior system because I think it's it's really quite good. So, but if you if when you um, when you test your questions, you haven't got the check button here. Well, that's because you're using the deferred question behavior, and you might prefer to try out a question to use the adaptive behavior so you can try it out. All right. So. Let's look at the author quick start guide before we move on just to see what's here and make sure I haven't missed anything. We have to decide if the student's answer is correct. Okay, we're going to determine its mathematical properties. That's the whole point of stack. So the potential response tree, well, it's called a tree, but really it's an acyclic directed graph of nodes. All right. That's so um, if you're establishing more than one property, you a tree may not be the right thing. You may want a graph. Uh, and we don't want infinite loops. We don't want to be going around in circles trying to decide if the student's answer is correct. So it's an acyclic directed graph. So it is, consists of nodes and each node has three things. There is S ants and T ants and they are compared with the answer test, possibly with an option. If it's false, we go down the false branch and if it's true, we, sorry, if it's true, we go down the true branch and if it's false, we go down the false branch. And each branch can assign or modify the score. It can assign formative feedback to the student. Yes, it leaves a note. So these notes, if we go back, um, if we go back to the tree, you'll notice that there is a, a space here for a note. And this is slightly cryptic, but what this means is that we are in potential response tree PRT1, which is the default name. We're in node number one and we are on the true branch. Now, uh, these are used for statistical purposes later because if you've got randomly generated questions, you may have lots of equivalent responses that all look very different from the student. So when you want to later, you know, in six months time, you want to review what the students did, you want to group all the students' answers that are in some way have traveled down your marking algorithm in the same way, even though they're different answers non-unique answers to a random bunch of questions and that's what the answer note is for. For today, don't worry about it, don't change it, um, but that's what it is and that's what it's for. Okay, so we have an answer note. Uh, ah, where are we? Uh, I resized the screen. Okay, that's the answer note. And then we have continue to the next node. Well, we've only got one node here, so we'll just leave that for now. Save changes and continuing. Okay, we've got a minimum working question. That's where you find the preview button. If you can't find the preview button, it's at the bottom of the page next to the preview. If the preview button doesn't exist, it's because you've made a mistake in your question. Let me make a deliberate mistake. Let's imagine I miss out the multiplication sign, so that's no longer maxima syntax, right? And now if I go to the bottom, oh, it is going to, it is working. Why is that working? Oh, it's probably because it's got the, yeah, it's, it's working because uh, it will preview the old version. It hasn't saved your question because you're missing star characters. Um, so if you're, so there, there are, I mean, I've tried my best to make it helpful for you folks as question authors. Um, but if the preview is not there originally, it's because you've got an error in your question. Previewing the question, student validation, next steps. Okay. I'm going to just stop there as an opportunity for questions. Any urgent questions? Uh, there was a question in the chat about the insert stars option on the input types. Okay. Yes. Thank you, George. Um, so some of you are no doubt looking around on this. So let me go back. There are a bewildering array of options for the all these fields and they're all here for a whole bunch of reasons, right? So there's a question about the insert stars. So what does the uh, help say? The help says this option provides a number of different options for inserting stars when multiplication is implied. Please read the more detailed documentation. So we go to the more detailed documentation and here it is. Um, there are lots of options. You know, what we want to do is we want to be as kind to the students as possible. And I want to support Stack over a whole range of different users from um, remote learners who are very unconfident about their own maths to school students to high achieving university math students. 
Now, for some of these students, they should jolly well learn to, to use a strict syntax. They need to communicate with the machine. They're going to be using computer algebra themselves. So for them, it's important they get used to typing in mathematical expressions that contain accurate representation of all the operations. But for other students who don't have such good access to help, um, for students who've never come across a function, right? They don't know what a function is. So it's going to make no sense to say, uh, to talk about functions in the feedback. For them, uh, it's perfectly obvious uh, what, what the syntax means. So there are a whole range of options for creating that syntax and the insert stars is one of them. So if we go back to the docs again, let me go back to the docs. What do the docs say? There are a whole range of options here. Um, strict syntax, I've missed, messed up my resizing to try and help you. So let's go back to here and scroll down to the input. And let's go to strict uh, insert stars and go to more help. Okay. Right. Don't insert stars. Okay, so that doesn't insert star characters automatically. Insert stars for implied multiplication. So if you type in 3x, um, then that's pretty clear what that means, isn't it? It means three times x. So if you have don't insert stars, then the students will have to insert stars. If you have this option, then they don't have to insert stars, right? So let's just go back and see how that works in in context. So if I put in the, uh, what have we got at the moment? We have got don't insert stars. So if we show you how that behaves, if I type in the student's correct answer and don't put the star in, it, it says you need to put the star in, right? Now, the system says you seem to be missing star characters and it even tells the student where to put it. So some of you may well be sitting there thinking, well, why don't you just, Chris, why don't you just put in the stars? <laughs> Well, that's up to you as a teacher. This is what I mean about you taking responsibility for your own teaching. And there are contexts in which I teach where I want the students to learn syntax and I want them to get used to typing in star characters. So for those students, I would um, make them type the star in, right? They're told what to do. Fine. For other groups of students where they're less confident, I would use the other option. So uh, if I'm, gosh, I nearly left the meeting instead of sharing my, uh, sharing my video. That would have been a bit of an embarrassing disaster. Um, if we go back and change that option, um, where is it? Insert stars for implied multiplication. And now if I go in here, right? It's just happily accepting that as a valid answer. And it is put, it's showing the student that it's put multiplication in there. Well, if you don't like the dot there, there is an option, a question level option for multiplication. And I've got the dot. I could put a cross in. Right. And now when we preview that, we've got a cross for multiplication. Right. So there are, <laughs> there are just a bewildering array of options for you folks. But they're all there for a good reason. And they're all there because people have needed them. And they're all documented. So I hope that uh, answers the question. I mean, it's in detail, right? But I hope it gives you confidence um, where to find the options, where to find more help with those options. Okay, are there any more questions in the chat? So there was a question about uh, attempt options and whether that's a question level or quiz level. That's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. Stack is stateless, okay? Stack is basically stateless. So the only thing that you can use to give feedback to students is their current attempt. Everything else is held at the quiz level. Now there's a penalty system for repeated incorrect attempts, which um, uh, if you're using an adaptive mode and you want to give the students lots of attempts, they can, um, they can sacrifice some of the marks for incorrect attempts, which basically rewards them for reading the feedback and getting it right. So it's not really a penalty system, but penalty is the, it's not, yeah, it's the, the penalty is an unfortunate word because really it rewards the students for diligently reading the feedback and acting on it. But that word is the easiest word to use. So um, unfortunately, we don't have any state. You can't say in the feedback, oh, your previous answer was better than this answer, right? You can't do that. Um, yeah, any other questions before we move on? Uh, 
yes, you should have access to the documentation. Um, Okay, right, so I'm just going to move on a little bit to the second part of the question authoring docs. We're not going to finish this off, but I'm just going to go through this now very quickly. We're going to use the question variables. I'm sorry about this broken video. Uh, I, have, I have fixed that, but we haven't updated this server. Um, random questions are created with the question variables. So if we go back to our question, and scroll up and copy and paste that into the question variables, we can now use, Maxima has a very strange syntax. The uh, colon assigns a value to a variable. So we're going to assign this variable, this value to this variable, right? So the variable X will be this, and TA will be the integration of X with respect to X plus C. And now we're going to change the question And I am going to uh, right. So what I want to highlight here is this data type called cast text, computer algebra text. And we have defined the variable x in the question variables. And this question variable is now available to all parts of the question. So in particular, we can embed the value of that variable into the question text, right? So in LaTeX, you were allowed to do uh, whatever you like with dollars and in an early version of stack what we had here was at symbols and anything between these at symbols was sent to the cast and evaluated and then we would embed the value of that calculation inside the text right now uh, at a previous upgrade we changed that to make matching symbols so you have to have a matching open curly brace at closing curly brace at this allows us to give better feedback to question authors who've got missing uh, you need matching symbols right it's just easier to match symbols like that so in particular here we've got the matching symbols inside our LaTeX we embed the value of that variable and now we can use these variables everywhere else in the question so what I'm going to do is scroll down into the input and instead of hard wiring the input, we're going to use the value of that variable. And then we're going to go through the potential response tree and we're going to, that's still the student's answer. That's now the teacher's answer. And I'm going to use, because it's an integration test, integration is a very common kind of question. So we have a special answer test that deals with integration problems. So we're going to use a different answer test and we have to tell the integration test which variable we're integrating with respect to, and it's x. So now when I save that question, we have a minimum working question. We can fill in the correct response. We can check that, that's now correct. And you'll notice that the answer test actually um, gives some feedback, right? The whole point of using this answer test is it gives some specific feedback to the student. You need to add a constant of integration. Now, I promise you, um, uh, you <laughs> by all means, if you want to really sit down and think what it means to have a constant of integration, okay? Uh, and how the constant of integration, how do you establish that mathematical property? It has a constant of integration in the right place. Right? I, I have sort of thought about that. The developers over the years have, in, have created a robust test whether an expression looks like it has a constant integration attached in the right way and what do you do if a student does something really weird okay what does the student i mean what happens if they do plus c squared i mean that is a it kind of looks constant of integration like but it's not quite right is it the formal derivative of your answer does equal the expression that you're asked to integrate however you have a strange constant of integration please ask your teacher about this and then the feedback that we added We've gone down the false branch ODEA. That was our feedback because that ODEA feedback was embedded in here. Okay, fine. So again, push on with the author quick start guide. All this is explained using question variables. 
how to um, improve the feedback. Here is the next tutorial on improving that feedback, which is explaining this answer test int, which I've just very quickly shown you. Um, then we've got adding extra nodes to the tree to test for more different things, adding in randomized questions. And then we've got a question test, which is how to automatically test your random versions of your questions. And we'll talk more about that on Friday. Multi-part questions. This just goes on and on and on. And um, uh, just to hope to give you some confidence that there is comprehensive documentation. I think what we should do now is to uh, switch into breakout rooms and let people have a chance to actually get to the end of the first part of the author quick start guide. Is that a, a sensible way to proceed for the George, are you ready to put people into breakout groups? Yeah, so I've set up groups. Um, so the people from Durham, I think I've tried to pick out into a separate room. Um, there's the group of PhD students from Edinburgh. I think I've set them up in a separate room as well. Um, everyone else is in a little bit of a jumble. So you'll get to meet people from all over the place. Um, there's, there's about between six and eight people in each group. Um, I think it, my list is maybe not complete because there are people who've joined the session um, since I started setting up the room. So if you're not immediately sent off to a room, um, I'll work on that and send you off to a room shortly. Okay, before we go into the rooms, one last reminder, please. If you've got question authoring queries, um, oh, it's the wrong Chrome, excuse me, folks. Uh, that was amateurish. Please go back um, to the workshops course and please put your questions in this forum at the bottom the question and answer authoring forum if you put your um, questions in the chat in they'll be hidden in the uh, breakout room chat and we won't be able to see them and then they'll disappear when the session ends so if you've got questions because we've got a little bit of time left and we'll be around for most of the day to help um, so if you would like those questions answered, please put them in the chat. And if you, are, if you already know a bit about Stack and you can answer those questions, please just go ahead and answer those questions, right? There's, <laughs> we'll do what we can to help, but um, you can also help each other. So please get stuck in and answer those questions if you can as well. Okay, thanks, George. Sorry to interrupt you. So there was one question in the chat, which was about what do you mean by the first part of the author quick start? So where should people aim to get to? Uh, I would suggest aim to get to the end of the first page. That's the link you follow to the author quick start guide and just get a minimum working question. Okay. And how long have we got for this? What are we going to do next? Um, we've got 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll have a recap. And then what we're going to do is we're going to reconvene online this afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. And that will give everyone a chance to have a cup of coffee and maybe look at the features and maybe go further in the author quick start guide or um, there will be uh, and would be surprised if there are no physicists here yes we've got support for scientific units i would be surprised if there are no statisticians here and so on and so on right uh, you will have concerns about your own disciplinary needs what what subject you're going to teach and hopefully in the question and answer we can then quickly point you to some example materials and some documentation to get you started in that in the directions you need to go Okay, so if people are putting questions in the, that Q&A space in the next 15, 20 minutes, um, we'll then close the breakout rooms, we'll reconvene and have a bit of discussion about some of them. If there's kind of common themes, maybe. Yeah. This okay. is not a simple tool. I make no apologies for this. Um, it's necessarily complicated and so it's impossible to understand everything in one go. So let's just get started and the goal is to get a minimum working question. Great. Thanks, George.